Professor Clive Landis, Pro Vice Chancellor and Principal of the Cable Campus. Our celebrated professor for tonight, Professor Cynthia Barrow Giles. Members of the Senate, members of the campus community. Uh, I think um, director of school or head of school of the of the of graduate studies and research Keyville, Dr. Shoma Roberts, and deans, heads of departments, students of the university, and of course specifically students of Professor Barrow Giles, who I think have always followed her and are following her tonight as well. Members of our online audience and also our viewers on our 12 UE TV channels. Members of the media, ladies and gentlemen, friends, good evening. Uh, my name is Tennyson Joseph and I am very, very pleased to serve as your chair for tonight's professorial lecture. Professorial lectures uh, constitute part of an academic tradition, a university tradition in which our colleagues who have attained the highest rung of academic achievement are offered a platform to present their work or aspects of their work to an audience and, and to give the community a chance to celebrate with our colleagues and the school for graduate studies and research is primarily responsible for organizing this series and tonight we are very, very pleased, very, very pleased to, to be hosting the professorial lecture by Professor Cynthia Barrow Giles on constitutional reform in the Commonwealth Caribbean, some insights, compromises and, and possibilities. To give you Formal remarks, I, I invite Senator Dr. Christina Hines, who is the head of the Department of Government, Social and Social Work and Psychology at Keyville, to do so. Dr. Hines. Good evening, everyone. Dr. Tennyson Joseph, Master of Ceremonies, Chief, Chief Justice of Barbados is not here, so I'll skip that one. Members of the Cabinet, Members of Judiciary, Professor Clive Landis, Pro Vice Chancellor and Principal, Professor Cynthia Barrow Giles, Presenter. Members of the Senate, Members of the Campus Community, Specially Invited Guests, member of, Members of our online audience and of the media, ladies, gentlemen, all, I bring greetings from the Department of Government, Sociology, Social Work, and Psychology. Dr. Joseph said I was going to bring formal remarks. Indeed, I will not. I will bring some remarks, but they will not be altogether formal. And I would like to start quite informally just by offering a bit of a reflection. Sometimes I'm not the best person to give a microphone to and a stage. And Sitting this evening thinking about Professor Barrow Giles, I was reflecting on meeting her for the first time. I was a new lecturer, newly minted PhD, 26 years of age, eager at Cave Hill campus, and I had heard of this lady, Miss Barrow Giles. The, I was told that she was the dragon lady. That's what I was told. And this dragon lady was the second examiner for my course, Women in Politics. I was really excited to teach this. I was very generous with the marks. And we had a wonderful encounter. She was very straightforward with me, maybe a bit blunt. And I then understood, you know, this nickname. But <laughs> beyond the nickname, I have to say that I know she doesn't even remember, but Professor Barrow Giles has really been an inspiring colleague, a hardworking colleague, and someone perhaps who is a bit misunderstood because she is so straightforward and perhaps sometimes blunt. 
on behalf of the Department of Government, Sociology, Social Work, and Psychology, I would like to congratulate Professor Barrow Giles in her achievement. When I got the news of her elevation, I felt as if I was swaddled in a blanket of joy. I was so happy to hear that she reached this level. It is truly deserving and the department shares in her elevation. When she succeeds, when any of us succeed, we all succeed. I'd like to take this opportunity to tell you a bit about this department. The Department of Government, Sociology, Social Work and Psychology. It was established as a Department of Government and Sociology in 1976. And since then, it has grown to GSSWP, this long name that we have to encompass social work and psychology. It is a truly multidisciplinary department comprising 13 full-time faculty, 15 part-time or adjunct faculty, and three ATS staff. They service the department. We offer over 40 programs with a student complement at the end of 2022 of 700 students. And these 700 students include 605 undergraduate students and 95 postgraduate students. They participate in 40 programs. And these include, at the postgraduate level, MPhils and PhDs, those are research degrees in political science, sociology, and social work. We have many interesting taught master's degrees as well in e-governance, um, psychology, applied and counseling psychology, and we have programs on the way. These disciplines are exciting and useful and our department has a vision, and I would like to share this vision. The vision of GSSWP is to position the department as a globally competitive, innovative department that is a hub for specialist knowledge in critical social sciences disciplines, that is committed to the advancement of Caribbean development through student-centered teaching and learning cutting edge research and excellent public service. I'll just pause and repeat that. The department seeks to position itself as a globally competitive, innovative department that is a hub for specialist knowledge in critical social science disciplines committed to the advancement of Caribbean development through student-centered teaching and learning, cutting edge research and excellent public service. Why do I bring this vision? This is because Professor Barrow Giles, Professor of Constitutional Governance and Politics, embodies this vision to the letter. She is a specialist. She has specialist knowledge in a critical social science discipline, the critical one to me, but I'm biased, political science. She illustrates a commitment to the advancement of Caribbean development through student-centered teaching and learning, to be sure. Through cutting-edge research, most definitely. Commitment to excellence in public service, this cannot be denied. Her efforts have contributed to positioning GSSWP, our department, as a globally competitive and innovative one. We have a lot to learn from Professor Barrow Giles. She is the longest serving member of GSSWP at present. She is our lone professor. She has, she has worked really hard to achieve this rank. And today we celebrate her, tonight we celebrate her. We have a strange way of celebrating people at universities. When they achieve the highest rank, we make them do more work. So you've achieved the highest rank, I know you got work. Show us, show us that you're actually a professor. And we look forward to hearing what you have to say tonight. GSSWP, in addition to celebrating you, we extend our gratitude to you for your contributions and your stellar service to the UWA, to this campus, to the Faculty of Social Sciences, to the department, of course, to the region, and to yourself. Well done, Professor Barrow Giles. I wish you a splendid lecture. Thank you, Dr. Hines, for this outpouring of 
gratitude and dare I say love as well. And can I now invite Professor Landis to give his words of welcome to us, Professor Landis. Thank you, MC, Dr. Tennyson Joseph, members of cabinet, members of the judiciary, Professor Cynthia Barragiles, our presenter tonight, members of the Senate, members of the campus community, specially invited guests, alumni, members of our online audience, members of the media, ladies and gentlemen, a very pleasant good evening all. It is my great pleasure to welcome everyone, both here at the Walk Walcott Warner Theatre and online, to the inaugural professor professorial lecture by Cynthia Barrow-Giles, Professor of Constitute, Constitutional Governance and Politics. Cynthia Barrow-Giles is, well is quite a well-known name and face among the public. And this public profile to me is a cause for rejoicing. Cynthia is the exemplar for how I would like to see all of our academics make known their expertise and their work in the public domain. All too often, our academics render excellent service on national committees and boards or international agencies and legal or trade negotiating bodies, and no one knows about it. This reticence or modesty, maybe shyness, call it what you will, actually runs counter to the campus's strategy, which is themed on creating value from our ideas. As the Cavehill campus seeks to create value from our research in society, and also value for the university itself by linking research with entrepreneurship. Let me focus here tonight on the aspect of how the university creates value in society and why Professor Barrow Giles is such an exemplar in this regard. UE academics are expected to multitask in three areas, teaching, research, and outreach. These three areas are reflected with dedicated UE awards at the highest level. The Principal's Award for Excellence in Teaching, the Principal's Award for Excellence in Research, and the Principal's Award for Excellence in Public Service. The same three categories are recognized at a university-wide level with the corresponding Vice-Chancellor's Award. Professor Barrow Giles won the highest award for outreach that UE can bestow, the Vice-Chancellor's Award for Excellence in Contribution to Public Service in 2021. You can clap for that. This capped an extraordinary year in which she led the CARICOM high-level team for the recount of the Guyana 2020 elections from May to June 2020. Please note the dates. That critical mission was undertaken at the height of the COVID-19 pandemic. But even before this capstone event, she is internationally recognized for her work on political participation and electoral mechanisms, having served as election monitor on numerous Caribbean OAS electoral observer missions, as well as the Commonwealth electoral observer missions to Ghana, Sri Lanka, and the Gambia. She has also served on the St. Lucia Constitution Reform Commission from 2006 to 2011. And of course, we all know that she is currently secretary to the Barbados Constitutional Reform Commission. Truly, Professor Barrow Giles is the epitome of the Cave Hill academic who is creating value in society from her ideas, which in her case is the research and experience she has been recognized for in her field of constitutional governance and the election process. 
Let me just add as a postscript that any appointment at UWE to the professorial rank is based on independent external reviews by three international experts in the field who are required to reach a unanimous verdict on whether the research output of the candidate achieves the international benchmark expected of a full professor. So it is with great joy that the UWE community celebrates its newly minted professors at such inaugural pro professorial lectures. They have truly reached the pinnacle of academia. Let me conclude my remarks by asking you to watch this space when it comes to informing the public about the outreach and service activities that our Cave Hill staff perform. As part of our 60th anniversary celebrations, we are launching the Register of Honours, Awards and Public Service later in the year a database that will be searchable by the public to showcase the honours and awards earned and, crucially, public service rendered by KFL staff. Please do enjoy the remainder of the evening and the professorial lecture on constitutional reform in the Commonwealth Caribbean by Professor Cynthia Barrow-Giles, with whom the KFL campus is well pleased. Thank you, Professor Landis, and my apologies for not acknowledging at the start the members of the Barbados Constitutional Reform Commission. Um, good, good evening and welcome, and also members of the legal fraternity. Before we get into the heavy matter, we need our minds to be put at ease and our spirits to be refreshed. Um, and to do so, we can only, in, in true Caribbean spirit, do so with some music, and more specifically with some pan music. And to take us through that moment of spiritual upliftment, I now invite uh, Mr. Joel Devanish. He's a former student of the Department of Government, Sociology and Social Work, a friend of the University still, a friend of our department, a um, member of the uh, alumni community and also a teacher of music at the Lester Vaughan Secondary School. Mr. Devonish.
How tonight you have heard many good things about Professor Cynthia Barajas and no doubt before the night is over you will hear many more good things about Professor Cynthia Barajas. What you have not heard yet is that she's a professor who is loved by her students. I can speak with some authority on that question because I am one of her, her students. I think I am probably the second or third batch of students that she would have taught. And just to prove this, I'll, I'll go to the batch before me, people like Don Marshall, um, Peter Wickham, Person Broom, many of the names that you hear about in the political circles in Barbados and the Caribbean, I assure you, would have most likely been taught by Professor Cynthia Barrow-Giles. Before, this, this, before tonight's session, I was trying to think about how many parliaments in the Caribbean today who would have um, students that she might have taught, and I probably would have thought about three or four, just off my head. I know in Dominica, I can think of one. In St. Lucia, I can think of one. Certainly in Barbados, I can think of quite a few. So she is a, a professor who is loved by her students. When we were doing the, when the university asked us to do the certificate in university teaching and learning, as part of one of our exercises, we were asked to imagine which animal spirit you think best represents your, your teaching. Who, which animal you think represents you? And I, I, I remember I always said, not myself, but I, I think that first of all, just would be a mother hen. Because, you know, like you see the mother hen walking across the, the, the yard and there's several chicks walking behind it. You always invariably see Cynthia Barrojas with a set of students following her um, around the campus. I always think of her, of her as a mother hen. And to prove that, the, the rest of the podium, all of it, the rest of it includes um, participation by her students. Okay, so the person who I'm going to call on now to give the formal introduction of, of um, Professor Barrojas is actually an undergraduate student currently, I think in his final year, doing political science and law. So Mr. Rahim Augustine Joseph, we call you to do your introduction, and Professor Barajaj will come up directly after um, Rahim has done his introduction. Thank you very much, Dr. Joseph. Chief Justice of Barbados, uh, Partisan Cheltenham, members of the Cabinet, members of the Judiciary, Professor Clive Landis, Pro Vice Chancellor and Principal, Professor Cynthia Barrow Giles, Presenter. Members of the Senate, members of the campus community, special invited guests, members of the online audience, members of the media, ladies and gentlemen, good night. I rushed through this because I did not want the time to stop because of the protocol. I must state from the onset how honored I am to be part of this professorial lecture, albeit with the easiest task, but paradoxically the most difficult task, because it is a Herculean, near impossible task to introduce Professor Cynthia Barrow Giles in a few minutes. But I guess this is why it's called an introduction, and I, and li I liken this task to a term paper for Professor Cynthia Barrow Giles, where the word limit is limited, but the task is great and the expectations are even greater. Ladies and gentlemen, Professor Cynthia Barrow Giles is a St. Lucian native who has spent and dedicated her life in the vanguard of liberty, social justice, gender equality and ensuring that the democratic fabric of the Caribbean civilization is critically assessed and provided with both theoretical and practical recommendations and solutions on how we can improve our democratic polity to reduce authoritarianism through constitutional reform. Most recently, Professor Cynthia Barajas was appointed as Professor of Constitutional Governance and Politics at the UE Cable Campus and is also a distinguished senior fellow in the Constitutional Studies Program at the University of Texas at Austin class of 2022 after pursuing a Bachelor's of Arts in History and Political Science and an MSc and MPhil at the Consortium School of Graduates um, of Social Sciences in UE Mona. Professor Barrow Giles is a former Dean of Outreach and at the Faculty of Social Sciences, Cable Campus in 2018 and head of the Department of Government, Sociology, Social Work and Sociology and Psychology, sorry. And in the faculty, Professor Barrow Giles has been responsible for crafting and teaching various courses, including but not limited to Introduction to Caribbean Politics, 
women in politics, Caribbean governance one and two, trade and environment, among others. Under the tutelage of Professor Barry Giles, students continue to benefit from sound theoretical knowledge and a bundle of practical real life day to day experiences drawn from around the world. Professor Barry Giles has authored three books The National Integrity System and Governance in the Commonwealth Caribbean, Women in Caribbean Politics, and Introduction to Caribbean Politics, two of which I have with me currently. She has also co-authored two books together with Professor Don Marshall, Living at the Borderlines, Issues in Caribbean Sovereignty and Development, and another together with Dr. Joseph, General Elections and Voting in the English-Speaking Caribbean, 1992 to 2015. Each of these publications comprehensively captures the historical and contemporary realities of Caribbean politics from enslavement to the present period and showing how in the various periods in our history we have shaped and determined our political systems, culture, resistance, and constitutional development. Professor Barry Giles has also authored 22 book chapters ranging from issues of OECS integration, campaign and political financing, women's political participation, the future of constitutional reform, among many more. But an introduction of Professor Barry Giles would be incomplete and a grave injustice if I did not mention her extensive academic work on women politics, and I quote from a book as follows, that she seeks to highlight and focus on few women who have successfully navigated the political realm, recognizing that most of the work produced in the region have tended to focus on maximum political leaders like Eric Williams, among others, but recognizing that women face significant discrimination to enter into mainstream politics in a significant way stemming from institutional of the patriarchy at various levels among other areas. This is a noble cause and it covers the struggles of Caribbean women in both formal and informal corridors of political power. For students and interested parties, you still have time to get the books, not only because it's imperative for understanding Caribbean civilization, but that Ian Randall has informed me that they have not run out of stock and now is your time to purchase. Professor Barry Giles has also published 16 papers in peer-reviewed journals around the world and Professor Barry Giles, or as we call her CBG, has also published extensive non-referee publications on websites, journals and has contributed considerably to the increasing of the public knowledge via Barbados Today and other newspaper outlets in her famous column called Imagine that. Yes, that's CBG for you. Imagine that. She has given lectures at conferences, seminars, major hemispheric meetings, panel discussions, podcast workshops, and the list goes on. But more importantly, or lastly, Professor Barry Giles has complemented a sound theoretical knowledge with practical application of democracy as she has participated in numerous election observer missions and expert groups across the world in Gambia, Sri Lanka, Asian countries, and other countries in the Commonwealth Caribbean. But more recently, as the Pro Vice Chancellor mentioned, was the team leader of the CARICOM higher level team to Guyana to be able to facilitate the recount within the height of the pandemic. Professor Barry Giles also served on the St. Lucia Constitutional Reform Commission from 20, 2005 sorry, 2011 and was appointed recently by Prime Minister Mia Motley as advisor to the Barbados Republican Status Transition Advisory Committee and subsequently holds the position as secretary to the Constitutional Reform Commission. For public service, she was awarded the Principal's Award for Excellence in 2020 and in 2021, she was the recipient of the Vice Chancellor's Award of Excellence also for public service. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to welcome a public intellectual, a regionalist, a social justice activist, a gender equality activist and advocate, a champion of liberal democracy and abhors, abhors authoritarianism in all ways, shape and fashion and to deliver her professorial lecture, Professor Cynthia Barry Giles under the topic Constitutional Reform in the Caribbean, some insights, compromises and possibilities.
Good evening. I will be using my mask for a number of reasons this evening, but I think that I speak um, loudly enough that you will be able to hear me. If you don't, please signal and I will, I will um, maybe remove my mask. Um, good evening. Dr. Tennyson Joseph, Masters of Ceremonies, members of um, Cabinet, members of Judiciary, Professor Clive Landis, Pro-Vice-Chancellor and Campus Principal, members of the Senate, members of the campus community, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, specially invited guests, members of our online audience, members of the media, ladies and gentlemen. I wish to begin by thanking the campus principal for the warm words. I also wish to thank, um, something here is missing, but I also wish to thank um, Dr. Hines for those kind words except for the reference to the dragon. I don't think I'm a dragon. I think I have some standards. And a lot of people do not like standards, and that is the problem. I'm not a dragon. You can't be a dragon and at the same time be a mother hen. I am really very into the mother hen. I think that is, that is the irony of this situation. You can't be those two things. And admittedly, many of us, <coughs> sorry, are two-faced. But that's not my two faces at all. All right, so we settle that. I am not a dragon. I am more a mother hen. But... Do not underestimate this mother hen, all right? This is very important. All right, but I want to thank um, Rahim, and you can understand why I selected Rahim to introduce me. Yes, it's unusual, and I did have to negotiate for him at the end um, to do so. But Rahim is one of those special young men that even the students um, agree in many of my tutorials when I'm getting difficulties with my students, perhaps that is why I have the reputation of being a mother hen. I would say, Ryan, boy, perhaps I don't need to talk to these students. What they really need to see is another student. And so what I, do, what I um, would do is to invite Ryan to the tutorial. And after the student have presented the tutorial, I say, um, Ryan, go at them. You take it, you tell them what they did right. You tell them what they did wrong, and he does, and they accept it because it is one of their own. And what Ryan is able to do is to get the students to, um, I think, aim for something more than they have, in fact, been able to achieve. Ryan is quite brilliant. He is um, a mentor to many of the young students on the campus in political science. I often ask him to assist students who tell me they have a little difficulty with the political science. And he does so, and he does so very willingly. He's also shockingly very experienced. I think he's only like 21. And uh, sometime last year, in the elections of Grenada, he actually participated in the um, OS observation mission. And the OES um, called me, yes he did, and they called and said to me, I'd recommended him and Kai, Kai is here as well, and the OES said to me, this young man Rahim um, Augustine Joseph, it is shocking that he is so young and with such vast experience, and he really was a joy to work with, and he's really excellent. They actually invited him on a second mission, but unfortunately he had exams, and therefore he was unable to participate. Um, I'm not sure that I am happy to be here. <laughs> I guess I'm like some of the other professors who would just simply like to go on doing their business, but this is part and parcel of the terrain, I guess, of being a, a professor. And so it would come at no, no surprise tonight that I have um, chosen for my um, presentation a discussion on constitutional reform in the Commonwealth Caribbean. And although I'm not going to have a very structured discussion in relation to the insights that I claim I'm going to provide, and I can only say I claim to provide, I'm not going to speak and say these are the compromises that we need to make and these are the possibilities. But I'm hoping that at the end of the discussion this evening, that you'll get a sense of the, certainly the compromises that we in the Caribbean must make in relation to constitutional reform, and of course offer the, um, you some you know, suggestions as to what may be um, some of the possibilities. 
So in terms of my discussion, I want to proceed by, um, you know, making some broad observations about constitutional reform in the Caribbean. I'd also like to um, sketch constitutional reform today. And you will have to forgive me, but of course, if we begin to, once we begin to talk about constitutional reform that some people find dry and boring, um, it would probably have taken us about five, six, seven, eight, nine hours um, to do, and that is impossible. And you don't want to hear somebody droning on and on about constitutional reform. And therefore, what I have done is to actually cherry pick um, a few issues, a few I issues to highlight today. Among the issues I'm going to uh, highlight because it is very disconcerting what has been taking place in some parts of the Caribbean, and it's not a recent phenomenon. And therefore, one of the things that I, I have decided to do is to take a, a, a very close look at the way in which we manage the no confidence motion in the Caribbean. I'm gonna spend maybe a minute or two just talking, and, and that is to do an injustice, of course, to the political opposition. But I'm gonna spend a minute or two talking about the political op opposition and then I want to um, move on to, I think, what is a critical issue in relation to constitutional reform in the Caribbean. And that is to look at what I call the, well, um, what we refer to as the, um, the constitutional bondage, or as Richard Albert puts it, the constitutional handcuffs. And to look to see to what extent those handcuffs are really frustrating um, reform of our constitutions across the Caribbean. And of course, because I'm so intimately, or was so intimately, as you heard, involved in the St. Lucia constitutional reform process, a process which lasted some five, nearly six years, there was no real uh, restraint on that, on that commission, unlike many of the commissions I've seen across the Caribbean, I felt, felt that perhaps what I should do is to take a very um, brief, um, look at one of the flagship recommendations of that commission, a recommendation actually I think I was very instrumental in getting the commission to buy into, and unfortunately, the political elite rejected absolutely. Um, do I feel dejected? No. Um, do I understand why they did so? Unfortunately, yes, and that's some of the, re some of the issues I think we really need to take on board. And then of course, um, following that, I will just sort of wrap up looking um, a very, br uh, making some very brief remarks in relation to constitutional reform. In terms of my introduction, therefore, I just want to start by saying, and that is quite, um, quite obvious, but I think it, I need to say so, because there are some people in the audience, one, the Dean of the Faculty of Law who told me some time ago, that when I was doing my, when I was going to do my professorial lecture, that he was going to come after me. I don't know why he chose to do so. He's a lawyer, I'm a political scientist. And there's the difference in terms of how we treat issues of a constitutional nature. So I'll start by saying the obvious, and hopefully you're not going to come after me. And that is to say that I'm not a constitutional lawyer. I'm not a constitutional lawyer, and generally speaking, as the same way I treat the economists, when lawyers begin to speak and economists speak, they know that. I simply roll my eyes because I do not understand the language they are speaking, and I don't think most people understand them in any event. So I just simply roll my eyes and say, well, talk on. Um, so our discipline, of course, as I think Dr. Hines um, alluded to, is far more, I think, grounded, in my view than those two other disciplines. So I'm not a constitutional lawyer, and too often, of course, lawyers, and not just constitutional lawyers, tend to look at the Constitution as a legal document. And yes, the Constitution is a legal document, but the Constitution is also a result of political developments. The Constitution is a result of the um, I would say influence of varied political interests. It is a result of political concerns from the community and all of these things are in fact reflected in the document, whichever document is that you're going to deal with. We must also note that society is also in constant flux 
and consequently, a constitution cannot remain immutable. I therefore have very deep concerns about those who see the constitution strictly in legalistic terms and adopt, therefore, a legalistic and textual reading of the constitution without understanding that the very nature of the constitution makes it a political document. It is, after all, about the organization of our political system, the nature of the relations between and among branches, a system of checks and balances and veto points, and yes, about rights. It is above all about power, governance, and therefore our constitutions in the Commonwealth Caribbean, and indeed world constitutions, constitutions generally seek to address how precisely those who exercise political power can be held accountable through clearly demarcated political processes. This is my interest. And while arguably there are hundreds of issues that are ripe for assessment, I have chosen to confine and therefore sh shape my presentation around just a few of these political and constitutional matters. If I didn't do so, we would run the risk of being um, locked in here tonight because when it comes to matters of the Constitution in the Caribbean, I can in fact go on indefinitely. But I want you to permit me some freedom to engage in some form of um, vulgarism or simplification of what I see as a divide in the narrative on constitutional reform. As I said before, some see the Constitution as a legal, legal text only. And therefore, what they do is to elevate the role of the judiciary, um, for instance, just for instance, and they, and they always seem to seek a legal solution to what may well be, a political, what may well be political problems. While others, I guess like myself, look at the political underpinnings of that text. This has therefore often led to a political, legal constitutionalism divide in the narrative of wrong constitutional reform. Um, because, of course, there are those persons like myself who see constitutions largely as a matter of politics. And, of course, having a very healthy, if not distracted view of the law and those who see the constitution simply as a matter of law or a legal instrument. But the two, truthfully, are inherently connected. That, of course, does not constitute the totality of, of the seeming discord between the two. But my presentation today will largely avoid that abyss in which I do not intend to be drawn, though it will seem odd as I do invoke the necessity of certainty and judicial redress. Matters of constitution reformation rest on clear and guiding principles of such reform and are located in the belief in a system, as I said before, of checks and balances, an independent judiciary, rule of law, um, the rule of law, for instance, we talk about um, um, the rule of law um, as a, a system in which government itself is bound by the law, in which all in society are treated equally under the law, where the government authorities, including the judiciary, protect citizens' aspirations for human dignity, and which is um, accessible to its citizens. But the constitution and constitutional discourse is also about the protection of basic rights, and even their entrenchment. And of course, it is about elections. And we talk a lot about free and fair elections. Um, and we know, of course, even from the experience of the Caribbean, that elections are not as free and as fair as we like to pretend. So today, of course, we speak of credible elections designed to achieve as far as possible fairness or equity and transparency. Now, over a, day, uh, a decade ago, in a paper titled Regional Trends in Constitutional Developments in the Commonwealth Caribbean, which was commissioned by the UN Conflict Prevention and Peace Forum and published in January 2010, although the document says 2011, I spoke of the nuts and bolts of constitutional re-engineering in the Commonwealth Caribbean. That paper was a sort of stock taking of where we were at the time. Noteworthy is the fact that in the intervening decade, little if anything has changed. I argued then that disappointedly, few Caribbean governments had responded positively to the reports of the various CRCs, and fewer have undertaken a, th a thorough rewriting of the sections of the Constitution 
that indeed weaken governance. I really ought to have said not one of them have in fact responded positively to the reports of the Constitutional Reform Commission. And for me, this is very vexing, even while acknowledging that most countries in the region have maintained high levels of civil liberties and political rights and have enjoyed peaceful transitions during periods of regime changes. It is vexing because as citizens, we are left with little doubt that the Westminster arrangements has been wilting and is in dire need of reform. In that paper, I also argued that our present constitutions do not represent, in the true sense, a social contract, as they were handed down to the Anglophone Caribbean by the former colonial master, Britain. In Belize, for instance, the constitutional conference held in London, for various reasons, excluded both the premier and the opposition. And it bears repeating today that the late Professor Simeon McIntosh, one of our own, viewed these constitutions as a product of, and I quote, an oligarchic elitist exercise. He concluded that because the collective self was not the author of the political community, regionally these constitutions continue to be perceived as received instruments from former colonial masters and fundamentally illegitimate of subjection to imposition from outside, end of quote. McIntosh therefore asserted that the independence constitutions are orders in council of the British Imperial Parliament, amended versions of the colonial constitution while Bill of Rights engrafted onto them which allowed for a relatively easy transition from colony to an independent state. This continuity implied no important changes between the colonial and the independent constitutions. The parliamentary system remained virtually the same, and the constitutions, for the most part, are said to have remained monarchical. This is the view of Simeon McIntosh. But that was over a decade ago, and in the interim, our understanding of constitutional amendments and revisions, appropriateness of reforms, and the necessity of reform has in fact exploded um, in a way that few constitutionalists and political scientists, for instance, considered, and with it, in my mind, there is the necessity to take on board multiple issues, which clearly I cannot discuss today, given the constraints of time, and also given the constraints of my interests. Be that as it may, I must unfortunately, I have unfortunately drawn the conclusion that the process and outcome of Caribbean constitutional reform are not buttressed by big visions and the need to transform relations in the Caribbean. They are not necessarily processes that aim for remaking of our constitutional fabric, and they are not always even processes that aim for obvious amendments that present themselves time and time again, nor are the processes always defined by substantive discussions of critical issues. If anything, I would say that some processes are marked by too many limitations and narrow elite and politically controlled objectives of the post-colonial political elites. The latter is sometimes revealed in the nature of and composition of the constitutional reform commissions themselves, arising out of the strategies adopted to convene those constitutional reform bodies. In relation to the narrowness of the political objectives, I would agree with the former chair of the Belize 1999 Political Reform Commission, Dr. Dylan Vernon, who argued in a recent paper, and I quote, it would be a lost opportunity if that is all that we do in relation to moving away from the monarchical system to an, in fact, a Republican um, system, of course, with a ceremonial president. When we do this, Vernon continued, we must make it more than just feel-good symbolism, more than just a changing of figureheads, which brings us to my second issue and more critical issue of constitu constitutional reform or that process of making our constitution truly ours. We should make replacing the British monarch just one part of a wider process of continuing our decolonization and forging a new and progressive constitution fit for our purpose our values and aspirations, best for our good governance, and that becomes a living instrument for guiding our sustainable development. Now, are the CRCs, that is the Constitutional 
reform commissions, um, which an, an, an constitutional, a constitutional reform commission is the typical body convened to consider constitutional reform. And we need to ask ourselves whether or not those CRCs are genuinely representative of society at large. Beyond this, we must also consider the choice of leadership of the commissions and the clear strictures under which some of these bodies operate, which are either self-imposed through a lack of awareness of what is required, a certain level of paralysis, yes, endlessly speeding in mud, or which are limited given a deliberate decision to tether the commission with spoken and shared vision of the selectorate, which is very narrow, by the membership of the commission itself. At worst, the latter is a farce of constitutional reform, a vague attempt to give an appearance of inclusivity that demands that minimally the people should be at the center of constitutional making. It is a rather cynical view of people and democracy in general. An understanding of democracy, the pursuit of democracy as we understand it in today's context, not the context of the 1930s, not the context of the 1960s, and not the context of the 1980s is relevant. And I wish to quote, therefore, Prime Minister Ralph Gonzales um, of St. Vincent and the Grandins, who made some important observations in relation to constitutional reform and the importance of people in the process. Gonzales noted many years ago, and I quote, constitutional reform is not a political abstraction. It is a major political exercise in governance, in, in governance revolving real flesh and blood people awash with their peculiarities and contradictions, conditioned by their socio-political history and contemporary reality. The very exercise in constitution making ought to involve an unprecedented campaign of structured mass political education of all the relevant philosophical, practical, legal, political, historical, and comparative issues. This educational campaign ought to be as far as the, comp as far as the competitive political market can bear a national as distinct from a party political affair. After all, according to Gonzales, the new constitution will go to the people, and that is his making reference to St. Vincent and the Grandins, will go to the people in a referendum for approval. So, considerations of constitutional amendments represent an important watershed in the life of um, the people of the region. It always requires legislative measures and sometimes, but not always, popular agreement. In Barbados, as you know already, the change to a republic required the former, the latter was in fact not mandated, even though the absence of a legal imperative ought not to always imply the absence of a moral or even a political imperative to ensure that there is popular agreement. And that moral imperative seems to be what motivated Belize to commit to holding of a referendum even where such a handcuff does not exist. Whatever the politics of constitutional reform, public participation remains vital to the process. It is, in the final analysis, a way of imbuing the, the, the process um, of constitution making and hopefully the final outcome of the process with democratic legit legitimacy by way of the acceptance of the proposals which themselves will need to also secure legal legitimacy in some Caribbean ju jurisdictions given the codification, well in all, given the codification of the rules governing constitutional changes. This is notwithstanding the fact that public participation carries with it certain political risk. And that is something that cannot be avoided. It's a risky undertaking. It is always good politics then to involve the public through the process of constitution making. And public mobilization is also very useful at the start of the process, while the drafting phase is typically something that takes place behind closed doors. Even then, the public cannot be excluded on the most constitutions in the final analysis on the final phase, as the public is really what we can describe. And I'm, I'm borrowing from um, someone that I can't, can't quite remember who it is here, but I'm borrowing from someone as the approvers of the final text. And this is clearly the case for places like St. Lucia, the Bahamas, St. Vincent the Grandins, um, and Grenada, for example. So sometimes I do critic the selection process of some of the CRCs, and this is really a broad concern. But I have to make the point that I'm in fact very encouraged by the apparent attempt to really center people in the process in some countries and the bipartisan nature of the exercise. 
to that extent, we can make reference to St. Lucia, and we can make reference, for instance, to the recent establishment of the People's Constitutional Commission of Belize. And note what he says. Not a Constitutional Reform Commission, but the People's Constitutional Commission, the PCC of Belize, which was launched on November the 14th, 2022. And even though there were many representatives from civil society, Belizeans, I think, objected to the process of um, selecting those individuals and also um, objected to the fact that some, uh, some um, non-governmental organizations were in fact excluded um, from the process. I would also like to say that ultimately in most jurisdictions, the public, the public as I indicated before, cannot be spurned by the political given the constitutional guarantees of such inclusion by way of a referendum, um, since they are the final approvers of the text. The irony of this, however, is that, the, that very often reform that is necessary, that we recognize absolutely necessary, can be killed by the referendum, which has in fact led to some critics to describe the referendum as an odious mockery and handcuffs that shackles even though there are those that insist that notwithstanding this, the referendum is important. I want to make a, a, a very cautionary note on the bipartisan nature of the selection or the representation at the level of CRCs. It is not a cure, it is not, not a cure, it is not um, a remedy, um, it is not medicine, it does not in fact signify that because you have bipartisan support for the process, as you had in St. Vincent, for instance, in the beginning of the process, as you had in St. Lucia and, and elsewhere, you don't see it sometimes in some countries, it doesn't mean that automatically the process would in fact be, um, be successful. Bipartisan support sometimes start at the beginning of the process, but it has not always been consistent and especially so at the tail end of that process. So while it is useful to be cautiously optimistic that toning down the adverse adversarial nature of Westminster politics in the context of much needed constitutional reform is healthy and good, our history has shown that it can die a rather quick but painful death. And we have seen that in Grenada, we saw that of course certainly very clearly in, in, in St. Vincent and Grenadines in um, 2009. I also want to make the point that not all CRCs, um, not all the processes of constitutional reform um, are internally motivated. And sometimes we do get a situation, and it's not very often, but it has happened, that is imposed by international organizations and powerful Western governments, and sometimes we could say in, indeed CARICOM itself, um, all of these seeking to achieve a solution to what is essentially a domestic matter, but which obviously the political elite has failed to tackle. And so here I speak specifically of the 2000 process of constitutional reform in Guyana, a process which was hurried, working under the pressure of an internationally and regionally imposed deadline, but which nonetheless achieved the limited objective set. Um, set. In that case, the process, unlike the others in the Commonwealth of Caribbean, was not aborted, nor stalled, nor, was the process, nor did the process fail given the mandate of the commission. And it's not just the mandate of the commission, but it's also the way in which the Guyanese approach the um, establishment of the commission, again, as a direct result of the input from the international community and of course CARICOM. What we saw in Guyana is that they um, created a commission which had representatives from, uh, from the major civil society groups all of the political parties, etc. Interestingly, the Guyanese also did not, the Guyanese government did not select the um, chairman of the commission either. That was uh, that person, as indeed in the case of Belize, that individual was actually selected by the members of the commission itself. So, in terms of, so this is the broad context within which we're talking about um, constitutional reform. And I'm very concerned with um, the, whether or not, in terms of what has been taking place in the Caribbean in the last 20 or so years, whether or not we can see any successes of constitutional reform. What I'm seeing before me is really too much failure or processes that have in fact um, stalled and very few examples 
of a successful um, um, process. So it is very useful to begin my examination um, by rehearsing some familiar points which are, which are directly related to the broad issue of constitutional reform processes and the recommendations arising, arising out of those processes. Now, we're really mindful that we have seen several constitutional amendments outside of the recommendations arising out of deliberately structured reform commissions. But I'm going to merely conf I'm going to confine myself to the issue of the functionality of our models and the extent to which recommendations can be both meaningful as well as successful. In that regard, therefore, um, I am going to reserve some time to look at some of the reports of the constitutional reform commissions across the Caribbean and to tease out why ultimately most have failed and at best, as the St. Lucian case would show, stalled. And even when I say stalled, I'm a little conflicted about using that descriptor for the St. Lucia exercise, largely because the report of the commission was sub submitted in 2011. It was not finally debated until 2016, and nothing, not one thing has happened, except, of course, this new prime minister has indicated that they are going to put a committee, I think, in place, which will look at the report and determine what St. Lucia can usefully adopt and what, in fact, it will not adopt. In speaking about the constitutional reform processes, as you can see here, I have labeled Barbados, and that will be from 1998 to 2002, I've labeled Barbados, and, and, and again, I'm a little concerned about where I locate Barbados here, as stalled, and uh, of course, where at the level of the executive in 2005. But, 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 but you know, this is questionable because we are talking about something which took place nearly 20 years ago, two generations ago. So that it may not be stalled and maybe where it really belongs is in fact failed. And then we can talk about the Barbados um, second attempt and that is 2021, a very limited attempt. And of course, that was successful. They made the transition to a republic. The Bahamas attempted in 2013, it's failed at the level of the people. The referendum was, in a referendum, it was defeated. Belize, um, 2000, again it failed. And Grenada, we have um, it failing at the level of, a, of the people, again a referendum in 2016 and 2018. And in St. Vincent and Grenadines, colossal failure. A huge bill went be before the people and failed as well. So we do have some serious problems in the region in relation to constitutional reform um, commissions. So as I indicated, there are a lot of things that we need to discuss, but I can't discuss them. What I'm going to do is to talk about um, what we see in the region in relation to first and second generation Westminster constitutions. And what we do know is that countries like ours, Barbados, Jamaica, Trinidad and Tobago, and the, other OEC, and the OECS countries which gained independence um, from the mid to the late 1970s and continue to the 1980s. These were not first generation constitutions. They were actually second generation constitutions. The first generation constitutions would have been constitutions like, and we're talking about Westminster constitutions, constitutions like um, India, you know, New Zealand, um, also um, Australia, etc. But our approach and their approach to constitutionalism was really political constitutionalism. And therefore what they focused on was matters related to parliamentary democracy. They didn't focus too much on legal constitutionalism. And in legal constitutionalism really marked the second generation Westminster constitutions of the English speaking Caribbean countries. So when you look at the first generation constitutions, they tended to lack judicially enforced rights. And you were, they were defined by limited constitutional entrenchments. And also a reluctance, it appears, to codify the conventions as we, start, we understand them of parliamentary government. On the contrary, when you look at second generation constitutions, what we see is that um, they attempted to codify those things which the first generation constitutions appeared not to be um, very concerned about. So that's one distinction between the first and the second. Perhaps what we need to do is to have a marriage of the two things in relation to, the, um, to our constitutions. Now, when we talk about the, our constitutions, 
We do expect, of course, that our constitutions would provide for civil and political rights. They would protect minorities, including sexual minorities and indigenous communities. It will um, also um, ensure, or should ensure, um, the rights of the political opposition and civil society to operate freely, freedom of the press in all its formats, credible, credible elections along the lines provided by international public law and best practice, citizenship, the independence of the judiciary, um, a clear remedy to guard against the potential of drawbacks or so-called democratic decision making, especially acute in the lopsided Caribbean parliaments that we have today. And so when we talk about the judiciary in particular, we must be concerned about safeguarding the tenure of judges so that no judge, unless he or she violates the terms and conditions of service, can be dismissed. We must talk about how we make, if it is desirable, our civil service neutral. If not, then let's say what it is. Because we are increasingly witnessing in the region the politicization of the service with the tendency towards contracts and political, not service contracts. And so, again, it is in the media um, yesterday and today, we have the, why do we insist on having the public servants, et cetera, and teachers be neutral? We have the, and, and, def, and we, have, we have the irony of the suspension of teachers in Barbados and St. Vincent and Grandins, notwithstanding precedents dating back to 1999 with the defrater's case um, in Antigua and Barbuda, and of course the Dean of Law, um, Eddie Ventos, who was a judge, also advises me that he, he ruled on the issue um, as well. So there's a lot of history in the Caribbean. There are a lot of precedents in the Caribbean in relation to that. And so it's a little bit surprising that we have um, you know, these orders that um, define what public servants can and cannot do, um, which clearly um, is in, in sort of in breach of what some of the decisions that the, some of the decisions are coming out of the judicial branch. The point I'm making is that we need to modernize some of those things and it's not a constitutional matter per se, but we certainly need to modernize them. But one of the things that we need to do is to look very carefully at the independent neutral guardian institutions. And I have a lot of concern about some of those, in particular, the elections and boundaries commissions, where they exist, where there's a combined commission, or in fact, the elections commission and the boundaries commission. We need to look at the process of prosecution, the police, the judicial and legal service commission, the institutions of financial accountability, such as the audit department. And with respect to these neutral guardian institutions, why are they so important? They are important because these institutions are designed to protect people from interference and protect them, sorry, from interference from government and to ensure their impartial functioning. And, and, and so we have to be concerned about the nature of appointment of, of those of the individuals who man them and the extent of the political control that we see um, obtaining in relation to these um, institutions which are supposed to be um, guardian institutions. Now I also know that some of our second generation constitutions have gone a step further with respect to the electoral system by substituting the first past the post system for proportional representation. And outside of the Caribbean, they have also adopted the alternate vote system, adopting reverse seats for minority groups, among other things, and as such, continuing, and, and as such a continuing preoccupation with both legal and political constitutionalism. In relation to this trend, we can readily see this in the Guyanese Constitution, which replaced the first past the post for proportional representation, and much later, of course, introduced the gender quota system. There is a concern with gender and sex balances, sex imbalances. And I'm going, even, I was going to say, even though there are those who deliberately push the thesis of male marginalization. I was going to say that, but I'm not saying it. The recognition that veto points in our constitutional order are inadequate, and therefore there is need to broaden access and empower a new set of institutions that will bolster the constitutional order, providing greater checks and balances, which to, in my mind, are seriously lacking in the Caribbean. And we also need to um, take note of all of those agreements that we are signing on to, that we are making, that, that make commitments to universal goals as exemplified, for instance, by the Sustainable Development Goals, the UN Declaration of the Rights of the Child, and that is just to name a few. Now, of course, yes, um, maybe this may be caught up in the issue of legal constitutionalism, um, constitutionalism as well, but it's also political. 
and, and I know that time is fast and I'm not halfway through as yet. So these issues, are, I'm saying, must clearly enter into the calibration of all constitution builders and reformers. To do otherwise is to miss an opportunity to modernize and to ensure that our constitutions are fit for purpose in this 21st century, not merely fit the purpose of a political class. And so um, I am just, you know, in terms of these constitutional reform commissions, um, I, I think we really need to be a little less conservative. Um, I'm not suggesting that become more militant, but certainly less conservative and take a lot of those issues, which for some reason, some of those constitutional reform commissions um, eschew. Now, I want to um, just simply sketch the constitutional reform um, today. And in my mind, when I look at the constitutional um, reform process across the Caribbean today, the, the, the members of constitutional reform commissions today, um, today, and uh, today, more recently, if, to my mind, especially when you look very carefully, and, and, and I'm talking about those, for instance, that have produced reports. When you look at the reports which have been produced by, in some parts of the Caribbean, for example, the St. Lucia report, which I spoke about a while ago, it would appear to me that members of the CRC were highly optimistic about the possibility for reform. And as a matter of fact, as a member of that commission, absolutely nothing was left off the table. Nothing. There was no political interference. We spoke, we deliberated, and we spoke with people. We went the length and breadth of, of St. Lucia, and then we um, you know, worked out and made, a rec re made recommendations. We made 190 recommendations. Not one of those recommendations have been um, acted upon by the government. I would say the process today is extremely fluid. I would say too that the goals of the constitutional reform process today appear to be modest than the goals say some 20 years ago. And even worse than being just modest, to my mind, the goal tends to be very timid. And what accounts for that? We have to be able to explain that. To my mind, there are already three things. One, too much control of the process itself by the political executive and the reluctance to push the boundaries of reform. And we see that very easily from the debate on the reports where such, in, such debates have taken place. It doesn't seem to be an appetite of meaningful change, for meaningful change, both on the part of the political elite and members of reform, some members and members of some um, reform commissions themselves. And I suspect that has to do with the experience of failed or stalled processes. Or the control of the political, all of them, all of them, the control of the political elite of the process. There's also the second reason why, um, as I've been intimating all along, that there is failure is because of the requirement of a high threshold that is a supermajority or hypermajority realism for changing sections of the constitution, what Richard Albert refers to as the constitutional handcuffs. And thirdly, we have, and I don't think anybody can deny that, we have highly polarized um, systems, and this is because of the nature of party systems and the political culture of the region, which is extremely tribalistic. We split people into two camps, them against us, which itself cannot be divorced from the issue of the constitutional handcuffs. So constitutional reformers, both those who initiate and those who build in it, uh, must confront what is at stake. And because if we don't do so, the end result will prove to be little more than empty gestures. The process must comprehensively address both large and small issues of socioeconomic, political, and environmental co concerns and must be open to the opinions of all. Otherwise, constitutional reformers run the risk, as I said before, of being accused of producing a constitution that lacks legitimacy. But equally, we must confront, notwithstanding anything I will go on to say in relation to killer recommendations, the constitutional text with respect to the restrictions that may exist that may preclude any parliament from totally transforming the political order. And therefore, um, we, but I'm saying we cannot continue to be scrupulous observers and retainers of the present governance arrangements when reform is in fact required. We cannot ring, for, ring fence the system um, because that is not in the best um, interests of the nation. So to my mind, and this is a view shared also by the former chair of the Belize Political Reform Commission, who argued that most of the post-independence key governance issues have not been substantially addressed 
and you identify seven of them. And you're saying this is relevant even for today. The powers of the executive branch, they don't want to hear about that, including the discretionary powers of ministers and the prime ministers. Lack of meaningful oversight and checks on the executive by the legislature. This is what St. Lucia was concerned about. A winner take all electoral system, widespread political corruption and vote buying, L widespread political corruption and vote buying. I think that bears repeating. And there, is, there are deniers about, of, of this, but there are widespread political corruption and vote buying. In some countries, the scandals come out. Some countries, there's too much silencing, the scandals stay in. Lack of regulation of campaign financing and political parties. Lack of effective participation from, of people and alternate, alternative groups and the constitutional monarchical system, which is the basic thing. So I'm going to keep this um, I'm very simple and I'm going to focus on, I'm going to just move very quickly, but one of the people I wanted to make reference to in relation to what is important about our system is that it's a very flexible political system. And you have Walter Baljot in fact agreeing that the system is very superior because the system is very elastic. Unlike, you know, the other political system, which is a presidential, which is very, um, in fact, rigid. And so what he concluded is that the beauty of the English system, and therefore our system in a sense, is what he calls the, um, the fact that there is elasticity. On the other hand, in the American political system, you, have, um, you don't have that elastic elasticity. Um, you don't have the ability, uh, what he calls the revolutionary reserve, which you can get in the um, Westminster constitutions. But, in, but, but unfortunately, we have too many abuses in the Caribbean. And even if the, the system is good, because it is a very flexible political system, we have too many abuses. And we see it very daily. We see it daily, and especially around election times, we see it on display. And we have to deliver this. So I want to deliver one major issue, for instance, and that is the no confidence motion in the Caribbean and how it is being used. Because I did say to you, I did promise that I was going to cherry pick. And so one of the things I'm going for a low hanging fruit um, in the Caribbean. And so I, uh, one of the things we need to do is to engage in some targeted interventions. Um, because I believe that is, um, dem that is really demanded. And if we look at the no confidence motion, it is something that we could see very re readily. Now, I would say to you that one of the guiding principles and conventions of Westminster system is that the executive for is formed by and is ultimately accountable or respond to the legislative branch of government. And that is very clear in relation to what our constitution says. You can see St. Vincent, you can see St. Lucia, for instance, about the um, need of the government um, to be accountable to the parliament. That is very clear. In Guyana, we see a similar situation as well. But all across the Caribbean, we have had problems. And one of the things I'm concerned about is the way in which we had political developments taking place in St. Kitts Nevis, which, brought, which would have brought, well, firstly, um, around 2012 or before, we had problems with the um, Denzel Douglas administration. And of course, there were shenanigans that went on for about two years. And finally, the courts ruled that the Constitution provides for a motion of no confidence. And therefore, a motion of no confidence must be held. You can't, therefore, dissolve the parliament to avoid a no confidence motion. You can't also prorogue the parliament to, to avoid a no confidence motion. Well, I say you can't, but that is clearly what, what, was, what has been taking place. So the, the government, um, well, the opposition took the Denzel Douglas, what they had done, if all the shenanigans, to court. And Timothy Harris um, um, argued that democracy was under threat under the previous administration. And we have to, and I quote, we have to keep the faith with the people of St. Kitts Nevis and to ensure that never again the creeping dictatorship of the past, the oppressive dictatorship led by Douglas regime, um, can happen again. That is what he said. And that is, of course, around 2012 and so forth and the other. Fast track, we have, Denzel Doug, we have Timothy Harris in, in office. So as he went into office, he did the right thing. He piloted the bill on the no confidence motion in 2019. And the bill was very, was, you know, very, very clear. It, it, it simply said that um, a, a motion of no confidence motion must be held within um, you know, 20 days after the motion had been submitted. Now, of course, we get to a situation where 
then um, Timothy Harris is challenged by within his own political party. And rather than allow the no confidence motion to be heard, Timothy Harris did not just prorogue the parliament, but what he did was in fact to dissolve the parliament to totally frustrate the right of the opposition um, to be heard. And we've seen that also in, in um, Grenada under Tillman Thomas. We saw it also in Guyana more recently. And we know that that, took, um, that went all the way to the, Privy Court, to, the, to the Caribbean Court of Justice. So my problem, there's a big problem. There's a big problem and we have to fix it. And we cannot, I think, depend on the judgment of men. The problem for our constitution is the lack of certainty. And of course, the other problem is that men, and I mean it loosely, both men and women are fickle. If we fail to deal decisively with such matters during this constitutional moment offered to us by revisiting our, our constitutions, um, and we know what, what triggered that, I'm arguing that we'll continue to face the potential threat of despotic government. So we need clear constitutional rules that will guide parliamentarians with a blueprint of what can be done and what cannot be done, a sort of, to borrow a phrase from Eliot and Bulma, and I quote, an insurance mechanism that certainty of action, which is not there. Unlike the British on which our system is modeled, we experience no constraints of history in such matters. And we have become increasingly emboldened by an electoral system that is not producing the kind of democratic outcomes and representation of interests that are desirable. Nor for that matter is the hyper-partisanship on daily display across the region manifestly seen in categorical, and I say categorical because they speak as if they know, and they know it all when they call in the popular um, 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 talk show programs, calling programs, and daily display across the region. They speak in categorical um, 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 statements on the media outlets about the contribution or lack thereof of losing political parties to the socio-economic environment, cultural and political developments of the states. So reforms such as this will certainly augment the limited but necessary checks on the political elite that would stay their inclination towards dictatorial behavior. And I do have concerns because in some of the Caribbean countries, we have reference to when on, on no confidence motion in the government. We have reference to no confidence motion in, of course, the, the um, speaker, um, not sorry, no confidence motion in the prime minister. In Barbados, there is no, I scoured the Barbados constitution. Because you know, sometimes you take things for granted that this is in this constitution, so it must be in that constitution. All our constitutions are similar. But I scoured the Barbados constitution. And surprisingly, there is no reference in the Barbados constitution about a no confidence motion in the government. So that is why I understand now why Erskine Sandiford did say, Prime Minister Erskine Sandiford did say, when there was a no confidence motion in the Prime Minister then, that a, oh ho, so you have no confidence in me. But a no confidence motion in me is a no confidence motion in the government because I am the government and it's not in the constitution. We have to make sure that we put that um, in, in the constitution where it does not in fact exist. And the reason I say so is because we cannot leave that to, 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 to um, politicians. I think politicians are very capricious um, and other things which I don't have time to speak about right now. And, and somebody here might be happy that I don't have time to speak about it because I realize that I'm, I am running out of time. So I just want to say, that um, we need to also pay attention to the political opposition. And that's one of my beefs. That's, I, 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 I really have a problem with that. The Constitution, unfortunately, West, Westminster is founded on the existence of, yes, party government, but it's also founded on the existence of an alternative in the, in the, in the form of the political opposition. Yet in the Commonwealth Caribbean, we have seen attempts to marginalize an already stricken parliamentary opposition. When we need to enhance, we need to fortify the opposition to provide what fusion of power and collective responsibility, especially in the context where the executive lacks any distinction with the legislative branch of government. And the upper chamber really does not exist as a bulwark against executive dominance. It cannot provide that. So we need an opposition. But we get a situation in the Caribbean where it seems to me that um, ruling political parties want to wipe out um, the political opposition. And we cannot afford to do so. So we need to put things in the constitution that would ensure that the, po the, the political opposition is in fact um, vibrant. So what I'm saying is that when we look across the Caribbean, we have a situation which I, I like to call the winner, the winner bonus phenomenon. 
we, we regularly experience that across the Caribbean. And probably this is a clear example. This is more than a winner bonus phenomenon. Don't care what the conversation they talk about, all the people voted for them, etc. People voted them in, for them in the, in the 30 constituencies. That does not mean that all Barbadians did. And in fact, the, the, the statistics, even if the, the report is not yet ready from the 2022 elections, it's a year already and is not yet out. But we know that at least 20, nearly 30% 30 of the population voted for the political opposition. But they excluded, and there are all kinds of constitutional implications rising out of that. So David um, Bissam and Stuart Ware argued that what is necessary is us, for us to get away from this exclusive electoral system which hurts the opposition and citizens. And we need a, a, a system in which the votes of all citizens do count equally. What we have now is a system in which the votes of every citizen does not count for the same. So they argue, they argue that we need a system um, in which political parties should be allocated seats in an elect, in elected assembly in proportion to the number of votes they have obtained in an election. And the concept does not necessarily rule out geographical considerations, which is what we have in the Caribbean, but it does mean they cannot be made um, exclusive. So the point I'm making is that we need to add an item. And you could see that in relation to, let me see if I get this right. We could see that in relation to here. Look at this, um, sorry, look at this statistics right here in um, Dominica in 1995. Where you have the United Workers Party, a newly formed political party, getting 34.3% of the popular vote, taking 11 of the 21 seats. Um, and, and, and therefore, they're really an artificial majority because 11 of 21, as far as I'm concerned, is an artificial majority. Well, almost an, almost an artificial majority. Because combined, you have the almost an artificial majority. Combined, you have the opposition taking 29.7 and 35.5, which is really um, what? You, you, you can see what I mean um, in Dominica. And we have it also um, in um, Bahamas, where you have in 2003, um, sorry, in Bahamas, the PLP getting 48.6% of the vote taking 18 of the seats, which is 76.1, um, 29, sorry, of the seats, which is 76.1% of the seats. Yeah, this is the problem. If we had proportional representation, which is what has been suggested, it would be um, that distortion that we see in exaggeration, which in fact certainly not take place in the Caribbean. So that's one of the things certainly I would like to put on the table. And I reach, I'm, I'm getting to the end, I want to talk about the basic structure doctrine and just I'm just going I'm not going to go into it in the interest of time and then I'm going to just talk about the handcuffs that Albert spoke of and I am um, getting to the end of my, pre my presentation so this brings me to the issue of the handcuffs which I've been making reference to and the lessons to be derived from many of our stalled and failed processes of constitutional reform in the Caribbean Constitutional builders in the Caribbean must clearly walk a narrow tight rope, largely because there are some limitations on constitutional reform set by the very constitutions that they aim to amend, reform, dismantle, and dismember whatever language reformers and builders um, choose to engage. The fact is that our constitutions provide for a fairly high bar to change the entrenched sections of the constitution, and thus often what is in dire need to reform is sheltered by the superior sanctity of entrenchment under the constitution and amendable, therefore, not by ordinary um, passage. We all know that typically what we see is that you need a, as I said, a super um, majority to in fact um, do so. And that is not always in the offering. And then secondly, we know the other bar that you have to deal with, just to move on quickly, is that you need to um, secure, in most jurisdictions outside of Barbados and of course um, Belize, you need to secure the support of the people in a referendum. But one of the issues that we um, certainly need to focus on is the issue of the opposition. You can't exclude the opposition from a process and really expect the opposition to then turn around and support you, to rally the troops at the end of the day to tell them to support even what in the opinion may be in the best interests of, of the country. And the other issue that I need to be, to be concerned about, even before we get to the issue of the handcuff, is that when we look at the Caribbean constitutions, nowhere in the Caribbean constitutions do I see anything approximating what you see in the Indian constitution and other constitutions in the world when we talk about a basic, um, the we we'll talk about the basic structure doctrine. Nothing under our constitution is immutable. Nothing 
there's nothing under our constitution that um, in fact cannot be um, changed. But it appears to me, based on the conversations I'm hearing across the region in terms of constitutional reform commissions, that there is this view that constitutional amendments ought not to touch upon the basic choices of constitutional design. So we are wedded, notwithstanding all the problems with Westminster, we are wedded. But the constitution does not say that we cannot change it, at least in some, in some other jurisdictions, you cannot change some things which are in fact basic. And there are three types. We just talk about the, the, the three types of this basic structure. And we talk, when we talk about basic structure, we're talking about the eternity, the eternity clauses. That is the character of the government clause. That does not exist in the Caribbean. That does not exist in the Caribbean at all, yet we are afraid to tamper with it. The second is the spirit of principle clause. Um, and although people say it's difficult to concretize, in some countries, too, the judiciary has actually struck down some amendments on the ground that the spirit of the principle has in fact been violated by a particular amendment to the Constitution. And the third, of course, is the character of the country clause. And in Barbados, does not attempt to elaborate that, but it's of course with the charter, but it's non-justicable, for instance. But it, it, it's not something that cannot be changed. Nothing in our constitutions hint at the existence of any express material reservation or limits on constitutional amendments. There is no principle or provision that speaks directly or unerringly to the legislature, the ju judiciary, the executive, and people's participation for elections. All of these things are important. Yet, even though in the express absence of, of, of that, it would appear to me that parliamentary systems are apparently sacrosanct and it appears that the system has entrenched itself in the minds of many Caribbean people and clearly the political elite. So we don't have that eternity clause, but we operate as if there's an eternity clause. Uh, etern um, um, eternity clause. And that is why, of course, we have um, individuals who argue that eternity clauses, unfortunately, we don't have them. But we act as if we have them. Eternity clauses are really operating like the dead hand of democracy. Because you actually lock in people into things that their forefathers would have, in fact, agreed to, like the Americans in 1787 would have agreed to. And in the 21st century, it cannot be changed because of the existence of these eternity clauses. So I'm saying we are blessed. We are blessed in relation to the lack of this. But unfortunately, our whole mentality suggests to us that perhaps we are stricken that perhaps these eternity clauses exist. And I just want to tell you, it in fact all reformers across the Caribbean that in fact it does not exist but of course um, we have these handcuffs that I spoke about a while ago and the main handcuff that we have that appears to um, bind us is the amendment culture the process of amending the Constitution and insofar as that is concerned as I said before there are two things we need to take in consideration one is the um, the fact that you need to get parliamentary support, and it's two-thirds majority in most places, as you can see here. And of course, you need, in many Caribbean countries, you also need to go um, to the referendum. And that is, in fact, the problem. So that when we look at our constitution, the people, that is the electorate, have been given an elevated role to the play in the process as the constitution stipulate, stipulates the way constitutional amendments in the final, uh, constitutional amendments. And the final analysis, citizens, as I said before, are the approvers or ratifiers of the draft constitution. And that has not always worked out well for us um, based on the experience um, in the region. So yes, the, 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 there is a need for a super um, majority, but unfortunately, that sometimes fall um, victim to the hyper partisanship that we see on daily display across the region. And I want to end my discussion by just saying a few words on St. Lucia and the rejection of hybridity. We worked hard in St. Lucia. We made, as I said before, 190 recommendations. And I think it has to do, um, and one of the main, our flagship recommendation was really about rejecting the notion that we have to maintain the parliamentary system because the people were asking for a separation of power. But we did not like the American political system, so we opted for a hybrid system. And all we were saying is that the people were saying the executive branch of government and the legislative branch of government need to be separated. In the parliamentary system, it is not. So we decided, okay, well, keep parliamentarism, but one of the things we should do is borrow somewhat from the French model and, in, 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 uh, uh, and amend our constitution to say that once you become a member of the legislative branch, a uh, member of the executive branch of government, you could, not be, you could not remain in the legislative branch of government. We made legislative, we made legislation and executive function incompatible. 
and when it went, when they finally debated it, some five years later, when they finally debated it some five years later in St. Lucia, I think generally speaking to a man, that is what really killed the, um, the report. And, I, and, and I, I take responsibility for that because I persuaded my colleagues to go in that direction. And I just want to share with you one of the comments made by um, a parliamentarian. And this is it. Mr. Speaker, can you imagine the recommendation 64? It speaks to there shall be a creation of a mixed model of government with a different kind of executive branch to that which currently prevails. But here what is interesting, Mr. Speaker, is the latter part of Recommendation 64. If a minister is selected from Parliament, he or she must subsequently resign as a member of Parliament to take up a post to take up a post of minister. You follow me, Mr. Speaker? In other words, let me read that again. If a minister, any one of you selected from parliament or the House of Assembly, you shall no longer be members of parliament. You shall resign to take up the post of minister, Mr. Speaker. There is an old saying. It is a very, very old saying. And I do not think it applies to what currently obtains, but I do believe, Mr. Speaker, having read that, the old saying just springs to mind that fools run elections and wise men govern. Fools run elections and wise men govern. So you're foolish enough to go and face the electorate. You're foolish enough to take them away. You're foolish enough to do everything, let them throw um, anything at you. You are elected, but if you were to be given a ministry, you have to resign from parliament. Fools run elections, wise men govern. Now, I do not know who was thinking what. I was thinking that it was reasonable, um, but clearly I'm a, I don't know, I must be a fool, I don't know. I really do not know who was thinking what, Mr. Speaker, but this is in my mind. It's preposterous and will not see the light of day. And if we permit this recommendation to see the light of day, Mr. Speaker, it would be reinventing the will. The master day will be back. I don't know where they're getting this from. They will be back. We can't afford that in our democracy. And there are others, but what it seemed to me they were concerned about is separating the ministers the members of the parliament, and they're only elected as members of parliament, not as ministers. That is the point. And what we're saying is that you need to elevate being a, a member of parliament, a legislator, to almost the same rank, including getting the same salary, as a member of the executive. But when you read all of them, I couldn't share all of them with you, when you read some of these comments, some of the comments, it was so disheartening, because there's a clear refusal to understand what it is you are trying to achieve. But what it is they want to ensure is that they have access to ministries which they can use to then engage in patron clientelism so they can win an election. That is what it's all about. So I want to end my presentation here. Unfortunately, I have to leave out a lot. Some of my harshest um, statements I had to avoid, and somebody in the crowd here would be very happy I didn't read them, but nonetheless, I didn't. I do not have faith in the governing or political elite. I have to say it. I have no faith in them. Broadly or narrowly, however broadly or narrowly, you may choose to define that political elite. For the most part, based on experience and observation of the double standards, the partisan-driven public pronouncements, and other often legal instruments, I argue that in the absence of constitutional certainties, we cannot be assured that the political class will do the right thing at all times and not resort, resort to political expediency. I believe that the political class is motivated primarily by self-interest. And for that reason, I prefer to speak of, of constitutional guarantees that will guillotine attempts to manipulate the parliament, for instance. I prefer, prefer to leave little to the capriciousness of that class and up instead for certainties, without engaging too, much re too many rigidities, spelling out rights, obligations, and clear processes must undergird the reforming or rebuilding of our constitutions. Equally important is the need to include the political opposition, even though such inclusion is not undergirded by any intrinsic belief in bipartisanship, because such bipartisanship is clearly a mechanism built into the Constitution for securing constitutional change, except where, of course, there is not a requirement for a referendum. Where there is an absence in the final outcome of our constitutional rebuilding efforts, we are merely doomed to repeat the all too familiar path of abuses and dysfunctionalities. However, based on what I'm saying, caution must be part and parcel of the equation given the self-interest that defines the political elite. Healthy suspicion of the political elite must be tempered by the awareness that the process of constitutional reform must be endorsed and ratified by that very political elite. 
so that every reformer is duty bound to keep in its line of sight, um, is, keep, is bound to keep this in, the, in its line of sight. That is the conundrum that every constitutional reformer must confront without necessarily capitulating sometimes in advance of the process itself to the narrow and sectorial interests of the political elite. Constitutional building must be a site for a vigorous discussion of so many issues, some very contentious, some contest contested, others readily um, relevant, that is that it is impossible to comprehend a sterile, unpacked, unchallenged, undigested approach to this critical issue. A constitution, after all, is a site for the establishment of a socioeconomic and political order. I know I took a little too long, um, Dr. Roberts, but I'm sorry. That's just the nature of constitutional reform in the Caribbean. <laughs> Thank you very much. I am. I am. I am. I am. I am. So, colleagues, you see why she is um, a professor and also why she's also a mother hen. It's because um, you could tell that this was a very packed set of ideas. She has, a, she has a lot to say, but obviously she cannot say it all. And the mother hen thing comes because after her classes end, the students still have to follow her after to get a little more of what, of what she has to say. So let us give her a, a very deserving round of applause. Thank you. And also the issue itself is a very complex one, multifaceted, diverse, and complex, including economics, politics, culture, a whole set of questions. And so it's a very, a very difficult area to make, to build a career on. So we have to congratulate Cynthia for that. So we now come to the point where we, we have our feedback to our professor. Obviously, you may have questions. You may have issues you want to raise. We will do it in a very orderly fashion. We also have our audience online. So we will try to balance our two audiences by giving a hearing to both. So the usual procedure, you have a question or a comment, our microphones are going around, and, and make, make, it, make it short, make it succinct, because there are many people who want to participate. So the floor is now open. I will try to do the, the emulate what I saw last week in another forum where one question was given to the, the home audience and one was given to the virtual audience. I'll try it as much as possible to pursue that format. So the floor is now open. Yes, Professor Winston Moore at the front. Thank you very much uh, for that lecture. I really wish I had your passion about this topic. <laughs> um, in one of the things that came up in your presentation was um, the independence of some of the institutions. Uh, and you had on the slide the Central Bank as, as one of the institutions that, um, yeah, that, that, um, that we could consider need to be independent from um, government interference. And there are other institutions in any country that you can also um, flag. But I was wondering, in, in the context of small states, if that impacts on the necessity for those type of institutions to be independent. Because in, in a small state like Barbados or um, St. Lucia or Trinidad, uh, it's really difficult to see how you can have an independent monetary policy being a successful approach to uh, economic development. So I, I was thinking maybe you might want to take into account the small state perspective when looking at the independence of some of those economic institutions um, that you might have flagged. Yes, um, thank you for that. Um, Professor Moore, I, 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 when we talk about constitutional reform in the Caribbean, when we talk about politics in the region, one of the things that we take into consideration, I think is this, 
is that the small size of Caribbean states brings with it a lot of difficulties. And among the difficulties, of course, critical mass. Now, let me just say something again. It's unfortunate that it is an economist that started the ball rolling, because you know what my position is about anything that I have to do with economists. But I get, I get your point. I get your point about um, institutions like the central bank, and not ne only necessarily the central bank. The point I'm trying to make, however, is that there must be processes. There must be options available to a state that will ensure, as far as possible, that we limit the interference in that institution of the political elite. There are models out there. Um, for instance, and I'm not going to go to the central bank, I'm going to go to something else that I prefer and I'm more pas passionate about, for instance, and that is the Elections and Boundaries Commission. We keep talking, and this is supposed to be a guarantor institution, we keep talking about it is an independent commission. The independence of that commission all across the, Car the Caribbean is really in question because the reality, the reality is that all of those East, um, e election management bodies across the region are technically political or partisan institutions. That is what they are, they're highly partisan institutions. The chairman is chosen by the prime minister um, across the Caribbean and two of the other five members are chosen by the prime minister. It's hardly likely you're going to get such a commission. And I don't want to impute the integrity of anybody, but what we are seeing across the Caribbean is that on, it is unlikely that they are going to go against the wishes of the government. And that is one of the problems with Guyana. Um, um, actually, um, Ronnie, Ronnie Yearwood, our colleague from law, and myself have done some work on, the, on GCOM. And, and, and part and parcel of the problem of GCOM, and it was in full display. Um, it has been on display for some time, but certainly was been on display since 2020. And the cases are continuing. Part of the problem is the manner in which, or the, the, the nature of the composition of that body, which, is, which makes it especially politically charged in a context, yes, of small state, but secondly, in the context of a bipartisan state. And when I say a bipartisan state, I'm referring to the fact that when you look at Guyana, you really have two um, literally hostile ethnic groups that um, are hell-bent on and ensuring that their political party, in fact, wins an election at all costs. And so there's a lot of abuses that take place in, the, in, in Guyana. And I spoke to one um, political scientist who's an activist also in Guyana, and we were talking about what took place in Guyana in 2020. And he says, for the problem with Guyana um, 2020, um, notwithstanding the so-called independent commission we have here, is the fact that it was, you're talking about the politics of oil and what is going to happen. And unfortunately, they waited too late to steal the election. The election should have been stolen before the day of the election, because that is what they typically do in Guyana. Part of the problem has to do with what happens at the level of GCOM itself. I mean, I, 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 I know what I'm saying, but it is a reality. So I'm agreeing with you that small states make it a little difficult for us to perhaps have the kinds of desirable level of independence, but there are things that minimally we can put in place that I don't see happening, I don't see happening across the Caribbean. Yeah. Thank you. Um, a question from cyberspace. Um, what, it, what in your mind, Professor, is the difference between legal constitutionalism and political constitutionalism? Um, can you give an example of each? Because you made references to them, to that in your, in okay, your lecture. I, well, I, I saw, thank you. That, that's a, a good question, sorry. Um, let me not be the dragon that they say I am. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the fact of the matter is, I think when I spoke about legal constitutionalism, I think I made it very clear that some of the first generation, some, the second generation consti um, um, constitutions were very concerned about ensuring that there was entrenchments, right, rights were protected, empowering a judicial branch of government that would in fact be able to scrutinize what the, um, what the um, executive and legislative branches were doing. And so this, and, and, and I did indicate too, that I was not going to get caught up in this because it is, it is a, a huge debate. Um, in terms of political constitutionalism, the tendency is to focus on things like the parliamentary institutions that we have in the Caribbean. So they're very concerned about um, what is the nature of the executive branch of government? Um, who, would constitute, uh, who would constitute the executive branch of government? What would be the nature of the legislative branch of government? These were the, the main concerns, well, some of the main concerns, not the totality of the concerns of people who, who we can classify as political um, constitutionalists. But that, as I said before, is really a bastard version of what the debate is all about. Um, 
Devron Bruce. Hey, good evening, everyone. And I really want to congratulate you, Professor Bargels, on what was a very insightful lecture. And I'm not surprised being one of your students for, for many years. So no surprises here at all. Um, so a constitution is a major tenant of a democracy, insofar as that constitution is democratic. And one of the major tenets of a democracy is really ensuring quality political outcomes for our citizens. Uh, you pointed towards the fact that many of our constitutions are inadequate in many areas, particularly regarding, for instance, how they treat the oppositional parties, for instance. But on the other end, many aspects are also quite admirable. They're not exactly dragons breathing fire on people. But yet, the quality of political outcomes that we see across the region are not exactly desirable. And the question then becomes, are we placing too much focus on constitutions and too little focus on the mechanisms that could ensure quality political outcomes? And is the response to those mechanisms ensuring those quality political, political responses are outcomes, a, a constitutional matter as well? Um, before, I'm sorry, yes, thank you. But um, could you clarify exactly what you mean by particular policy outcomes? So, when we look at the economies of the region, for instance, when we look at, let's say, GDP, when we look at things such as, uh, you know, um, capital income, for instance, when we look at housing, when we look at sanitation, when we look at all the social issues that we would consider to be outcomes that are desirable for people, so persons not living in squalor, poverty, good sanitation, good health care, education, uh, laws, what, what have you, quality political outcomes, many of them are simply not there. And the mechanisms that would ensure these outcomes, whether it be parliament, whether it be labor, whether it be the private sector, whether it be schools, what entities that exist that are responsible for ensuring the delivery of these outcomes, the bureaucracy, for instance, they are simply not producing what we would consider quality political outcomes. So are we placing too much focus on the constitutional aspect and too little focus on the mechanisms? And is there a constitutional response to the fact that the mechanisms that we currently utilize are not meeting the requirements to get those political outcomes that we desire? Okay, that, that's a big question, and um, I appreciate the question, but I don't think that in, um, you know, in considering the, 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 the question, that you can in fact avoid, nonetheless, a discussion of our constitutions. The, rea the reality is that the constitutions are, um, or the constitutions in the regions are responsible for, or at least um, demarcate the relations that we have, how people are elected into parliament, the kind of processes that take place in Britain, for instance, we see that um, the, the, the British political system has evolved to a point where, in terms of the, the parliament itself, there are opportunities for the opposition to participate in a very meaningful way. So that, for instance, one of the things they have instituted is the question time. We know that, and, and Devron, you know that, in relation to our own political system in the region, one of the issues that we have to be concerned about is that we do not have these exposed behavioral mechanisms. We don't have the all. In Britain, there are certain things they have done in order to close that gap. Now, as I indicated sometimes before, that when we look at the Caribbean, what we see is a situation where we are perfect mimic, uh, mimic men. We mimic very well what the British do. Um, in terms of the conventions. One of the things that's quite alarming to me, for instance, is the fact that um, for the, 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 the monarchical um, constitutions and therefore countries which still, have, which still are consti um, constitutional monarchies, one of the things we see every time there's an opening of parliament, for instance, is the ceremonial dragging of the, of the, of the don't smile, it's, that's not going to smile about, is the <laughs> ceremonial dragging of the, of, the speaker of, of the speaker of the house. And I said to myself, do these idiots understand um, the, 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 the history of the dragging of the speaker? This has nothing to do with the history of the region. And so what, I, what I'm suggesting is that clearly we need to pay, we need to um, um, pay some attention to our constitution, our constitution. We need to pay attention to those things, but I, I get your point that certainly when we look at socioeconomic indicators in the region, that um, some Caribbean governments um, at some points in time, not all of them, so we can't make broad statements about what is taking place in the Caribbean, have in fact not delivered for the people. And, uh, but sometimes, Devron, quite frankly, um, you can't only blame politicians. Um, it takes two hands to clap. And unfortunately, in some Caribbean countries, we do have people for one reason or the other, and, and some of them are very educated, and I agree with what um, the former Prime Minister said recently in his speech. Um, they are very educated, 
um, we think they are very independent and they are willing to speak out. There is a culture in the Caribbean that are likened to groupthink. And that groupthink culture does not allow people to make comments. That's why they call me a dragon. To make comments that people do not always, that politicians, for instance, and those in authority would not always appreciate. But what I would like to see is a more um, mobilized population, a population that can actually divorce itself from its partisan politics that results in the kind of comments I hear people make to Kristina, for instance, online that says the, in, in the history of the DLP, they have made no, um, no contribution to the socioeconomic development of the country. And I say, but I mean, where are you? Are you someplace on the moon? I mean, if you're talking about the University of the West Indies, and if you're talking about university education, if you're talking about the Barbados Community College, etc., we know that that is associated, for instance, with the Barbados Labour Party. Yes, we, with, sorry, the Democratic Labour Party. Yes, we know the Democratic Labour Party have made its, it, have had some problems, but that is not to suggest that they have made absolutely no contribution to the socioeconomic development of the country. That is what is going on, and it's a direct result of the kind of dependency that I think politicians have encouraged of our population. I think it is also a consequence of the fact that we have a political system in which there is not adequate monitoring of, say, the, um, the finances, political money that comes into the system, which enables sometimes some political parties to win an election very handsomely. For instance, in one country in the Caribbean, I'm not going to name it, I'm not going to name the country, one, one political party contested an election and had 14 mil, um, $30 million. The population is, by the way, under 100,000 people. Yet they spent $30 million in the election, I'm saying, but you spent $30 million on what? Because your population is, for an election, your population is, is, is under $100,000, under 100,000 100, people. And you talk about poverty, you talk about the failure of housing policy, you talk about the failure of education policy, and so forth. And yet you can spend, by way of handouts, $30 million, rather than take the, the $30 million, I don't know where this is coming from, the $30 million and invest it in those sort of developments. So one of the things I would like to see clearly is a more, um, civic-minded population, a population which, which is more willing to advocate for the things that they, they believe are necessary, irrespective of their political persuasion. And I know I'm answering your question in the way you'd like me to answer your question, but that is how I'm going to answer it nonetheless. That is perfectly fine. Okay, I think I will take um, two questions from, I'll, I'll combine two questions from from online because they kind of short and they're asking similar type questions. So the question is, should we say fail? If the people decide, have you already failed? So I think they're referring to when you said some have failed, I think. Mm -hmm. and, and, and following that is, um, um, can you, can, what, what can you say you, what, what you might want to see compromise on and what should we not compromise on in constitutional reforms? Okay, so I the first question is, why do you use the word fail if people have actually voted against something? And secondly, in your own estimation, see the things you think are fundamental that you that you what we should not compromise on, and what you think we might okay. compromise on. Um, okay, I labeled some of the um, constitutional reform exercises in the Caribbean as failed processes, largely because um, you know the constitutional reform commissions would have met over an extended period of time. They would have canvassed the opinions of people all across um, the nation as well as overseas. And they have made recommendations on the basis of those consultations as well as, of course, um, the views of the commissioners themselves and the assessment of what may be in the best interest of the country. Having done that, sometimes if you like look at the case of St. Lucia, a process which began, say, January 2026, but um, January um, 2006, but really at the end of 2005, and did not sub submit a report until January 2011. So that is, it, that is about five years. And made 190 recommendations, going to um, you know, the, the fundamental rights, we didn't say much about gender, unfortunately, we constrained um, in relation to that. We made recommendations in relation to the Prime Minister and the Deputy Prime Minister. We made recommendations in relation to, answering the second question one time as well. Mm -hmm. We made recommendations in relation to, um, you know, the, 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 what type of presidency we should have in St. Lucia. We made recommendations in relation to the Elections and Boundaries Commission and the type of electoral system that we should have. We spoke about the need to have a recall mechanism, for instance, and not a single one 
of those recommendations were in fact taken aboard. Uh, there was discussion, as I said before, in 2016, and uh, I think everything else, all the recommendations, most of them, the recommendations we made, unfortunately, fell victim to an overly a over concern with the flagship, what I call the flagship rec recommendation, and that is the hybrid political model. And, and, and the government and the, the opposition as well, who participated in the debate, they, they, they did not support, even if you had rejected this particular recommendation, because unlike the Constitution Reform Commission of Barbados of 2022, that commission was not asked to prepare any draft constitution. We were merely asked to prepare a report. And we made 190 recommendations. Some of them were low lying. They could have, it would have not, it, um, no hanging, it would have not made any fundamental difference, not any fundamental difference to the operation of the system. What would have done is to close some loopholes that we saw and improve the overall efficiency of the system. Yet still, nothing was, was taken. And I cannot say therefore, and, and you, I'm talking about the people in St. Lucia, it didn't get past the parliament. It was killed in the parliament because of what I call this killer recommendation on the establishment of a hybrid political model. So to me, it failed. In St. Vincent and Grenadines, you can say it failed. In, 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 in Grenada, it failed. But part of the problem in Grenada and St. Vincent and Grenadines, St. Vincent and Grenadines is a little more complex because they put the entire um, constitution, I think, um, to the people, and that was a problem. And the second thing, too, is that the people, the, the opposition, um, was very strategic in relation to what it did in the country. In the beginning of the process, it was involved in the discussions and so forth. When it came to the point of going to people in a referendum, it withdrew that critical support to the process. And that's why I, talk, I, I speak about hyper-partisanship. Um, the other thing we have to recognize, and it is very clear in relation to Grenada, that you can talk about the people say, how they say, but the reality is that in terms of that, re that um, 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 referendum in Grenada, there was a very low voter turnout of under 50%. So the vast majority of the people stayed home. They are a silent majority, and we have to find ways to draw out that silent majority. Because what we are hearing from is a small group of people who are very vocal, and they do not necessarily speak on the behalf of the population. And so to that extent, I'm saying because absolutely nothing was done in relation to the recommendations that were made, those recommendations were actually coming from the people, and it is, a, it is now over 10 years, then I have to say that it in fact failed. That is, that is how I defined mm. failure. In relation to what can be done, I really think, quite frankly, but it seems to me that given the debate I heard in St. Lucia, that is not um, about to happen. It is really a killer, um, uh, a killer recommendation. We, we can't, in, in the context of the, of, of the Caribbean, engage in any reform, it seems to me, on the basis of what I'm, I'm seeing in the Senate report. Um, Whittle done in any way, it seems to me, the power of the Prime Minister, except insofar as perhaps um, putting some strictures in relation to the use of the um, prorogation um, um, provision, and secondly, um, in relation to the dissolution of Parliament. Now, I'm saying that we, we are perfect mimic, not perfect, we are less than perfect mimic, mimic men in the region. We, we believe that we have mimicked very perfectly the British political system. But the British have evolved beyond mm. the Caribbean. Mm. And one of the things we see in, the Carib in, in Britain, and I think everybody here is very well, of the, very, very well aware of the fact, Britain has been making some amendments to its constitution, which, which is in fact designed to reduce the kind of abuses that we're seeing. So on display before us um, in the last three months, three months, I don't even know the, the, the last prime minister, I, oh yes, Liz Truss. I mm. nearly said I, I, I always forget her name because she was in, power for, she was in office for, for 43 days. Mm. Yet still the government did not collapse. That is an issue. So we in the Caribbean believe that as long as this individual who merely won an election in a particular constituency, but happened to be the leader of the political party, becomes the prime minister, that in fact, notwithstanding what the text of the constitution says about a prime minister, that the prime minister is in fact above everybody else and has the final say. So can in fact um, um, dissolve the parliament it be, merely because the parliament no longer has confidence in your capacity to lead as a prime minister. I don't think that we should equate 
confidence in a prime minister with confidence in government. And that's why I'm saying that one of the things we need to do, and to me it's easily done, the British are doing it, is to ensure that, and we, we don't have to, and, 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 I'm not, and I'm not even getting to the issue of fixed date of election, mm -hmm. which is a, a huge issue. We can spend hours discussing fixed date of election. But what I'm saying is that, like the British, perhaps what we could do, since we are such perfect mimic me, what we can do is to simply say that yes, you, um, um, the parliament um, can be dissolved, but it should only be dissolved prior to the five years. So that is where you're going for the fixed date. In a context where one, you believe um, when you get two thirds of the people in the parliament agreeing to an early dissolution, or secondly, and absolutely only in the context where there's a successful no confidence in the government. But that means we have to go back to ensuring that we really ground the no confidence motion so that when, um, when, when the opposition says that it wants to table a no confidence motion, that they have a right to be heard and that the, the, the no confidence motion is in fact held, which is not the practice in the region. I do not see why in the region we should have e elections taking place, and I'm going to use the case of St. Lucia. I'm going to use it, not because I'm afraid of anybody, I'm going to use the case of St. Lucia. And in 1987, we had two elections in a matter of three weeks in St. Lucia. And the only reason why we had two elections in St. Lucia in a matter of three weeks is because the Prime Minister at the time did not like the majority that he had, which was a slim working majority. So he put the nations through this trial for an, an expense because he wanted to increase his majority. That's in 1980. Three weeks apart, in April of 1987, we had two elections. And the end result of the second election was the same as the previous election, 9-8. I mean, that's, a, that's abuse. And all I'm saying is that constitutionally, we have to ensure that those abuses are in fact checked. Mm -hmm. That's just one. And I say, you know, we can go on. I can go on for hours mm -hmm. about constitutional reform. <laughs> but I know we don't have hours here. It's already mm -hmm. almost 9 o'clock. Right, and that, that reminds me from our producer before we started that we, we have a two, it was a, a two hour program. So I, Professor Ventos has a question, and I suspect after Professor Ventos we can take maybe, maybe one or two yeah, questions after no. that. Mm -hmm. Professor Ventos. Um, good evening everyone. Um, thank you very much mm -hmm. Professor Barajaz for your, your excellent lecture. Um, when you think of constitutional reform, um, the process is firstly engaged where persons come together representing various constituencies in, in every country, then consult with the people. But is it not an exercise in sovereignty where the report or various amendments are put to the people and it's rejected? Isn't that not an exercise by the people to say that we like what we have, we do not want these amendments? So, so. What do you say to that? That can the people in the Caribbean not see we don't want these changes and we like what we have? So I just want to understand what's the difficulty with, with Caribbean people saying, well, we like it, simply. The point I'm making, if you tell me that you put something to a referendum, I'm saying referendums are good, I'm saying they're also bad, so it's a risk. Um, and I, I think I made it very clear um, this evening that the people must be central um, to the process. What I'm saying in relation to the referendums we have in the Caribbean is that they have fallen victim to partisan politics. And that unfortunately, we also do have a situation in the Caribbean. In spite of the consultation, as I just indicated, the people who come out to speak are the, um, the, 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 the um, local mm -hmm. minority. Yes, we go to some communities. I've spoken before about my experience in Senegal, for instance. We've gone to communities. We're hearing from them, so we have done what we were asked to do. But when we go to some other communities to listen to some people, sometimes there are five people in front of you, and you're in the community. You have heard from those five people, but you haven't heard from the majority. When it comes time to, for the referendum, 30% of the population turns out to vote. I don't necessarily think that that is, in fact, the voice of the people. And so that is what I'm, that's why I'm saying that, um, you, you know, um, the referendum, yes, has killed a process, um, but it does not necessarily translate to the people making a decision that they didn't want that. What we are seeing is some manipulation of the process. What we are seeing is that people who feel alienated from the process from some, some reason or the other. So that I agree with Gonzalez, but don't drag me into that Gonzalez since right now because it's a little more complex. I agree with Gonzalez that when you talk about constitutional reform, one of the key things you have to do is to engage with your population, not only have an educational program, really bring them out, inform them, educate them so they are learners of the process. So at the end of the day, 
they're in a position where, quite apart from the polit party politics, they can make a rational decision about what is in fact being put before them. Because ultimately, um, what I have seen so far in many countries, what have been put before the people have actually been um, suggestions of people calling into programs, suggestions of people at the various town hall meetings, and also in, this, in St. Lucia, we went to the workplace. We went into the schools to talk to people. This, um, but it didn't get to the point where we had a referendum. So um, I get your point, but I'm saying nonetheless that the, the process of, of, of constitutional reform in the Caribbean, um, where it has um, gone to a referendum, does not and, and has failed, or the referendum was defeated, does not in fact suggest that that is the final say of the people or the, or the, the majority of the people, because it is less than 50% that have turned out in most of those referendums. And I think also in, in the case of some referendum, they ask for special majorities too, yes, not just a simple, a simple majority. I think we've had an excellent evening. We'll take, I think we can take one more question from Gerald and we will bring it to a close. Gerald, right next to you. Okay, we'll take the last one. So Thank after Gerald, there will be no more questions. Thank you, evening. Um, it, it is not a question, it's just a comment. Um, first of all, Cynthia, thanks for the invitation. And I don't want to be one of those people who will be standing over you and saying this or say no. I am forever eternally grateful to you for, when, when Tennyson talked about the mother hen, I just remembered Jamaica. Um, for the assistance and the guidance that you would have given me while I was here at UE. Um, and I know that there are many others who can echo those, echo those sentiments, but I want to say it to you when you can hear it. So thank you very much. I'm not a dragon. And we now invite um, another one of um, Professor Barajati's students, this time he a postgraduate student to do the formal, um, to give closing remarks. Alexander Tillett from Belize. Dr. Tennyson Joseph, Master of Ceremonies, Chief Justice, Chief Justice of Barbados, members of cabinet, members of judiciary, Pro Professor Clive Landis, Pro Vice Chancellor and Principal, Professor Cynthia Barra Giles, Presenter, Members of the Senate, Members of the Campus Community, Special Invited Guests, Members of our online audience, Members of the media, ladies and gentlemen. As we bring this evening's professional lecture to a close, the School for Graduate Studies and Research would like to give special thanks to Prof Professor Clive Landis, Pro, Vi Pro Vice Chancellor and Principal for his welcome address. Senator Dr. Christina Hines, Head of the Department of Government Sociology, Social Work and Psychology for giving the opening remarks. Dr. Tennyson Joseph, Senior Lecturer in Political Science for chairing tonight's event and moderating the question and answer segment. Mr. Joel Devonish for providing the entertainment for tonight. Mr. Rahim August, Augustine Joseph for that insightful introduction of our speaker the staff for ensuring that the event runs smoothly, the audience both in person and online for taking the time out to attend tonight's professional lecture. And last but certainly not least, Professor Barrow Giles, our Professor of Constitutional Governance and Politics and our speaker tonight. Thank you, Professor Barrow Giles, for guiding us down the path of constitutional reform, highlighting to us the process and difficulties it faces. Thank you for your outstanding and continuous contribution, a job exceptionally done. Your work has not only contributed immensely to academia and policy, but it has left an imprint. It has inspired and it has given us the knowledge to understand and look at constitutional reform, especially in the Caribbean context, with a keen and analytical eye. We have learned that it is of utmost importance that we are reminding, reminded of the necessity of having a homegrown constitution, one that reflects our political structure. We need rules that are carefully crafted by our people, our Caribbean minds, which take into account the ability and have, and have the ability to adapt to ever-changing structure, history, resources, the shocks we face, our diversity, philosophy, language, culture, and traditions, rules that are fair and that deepen our democracy. 
and your lecture tonight has taught us, taught us that although these factors are necessary, the constitutional reform process still has obstacles to overcome, whether it be due to referendum processes or, or sorry, sorry, referendum processes or the par parliamentary process. Nevertheless, we remain hopeful as we see many Caribbean states making steps towards constitutional reform, such as Belize. It has truly been a pleasure to be here tonight and being a part of tonight's program. Thank you all again and good night.